It started about two weeks ago, and now you can't escape it. What began with hushes and whispers, the occasional ominous news article or TV soundbite has now escalated into a full-blown panic about the global pandemic that swept the globe, and it's crept into every facet of life. You can't hug anyone without worrying that he or she might be a carrier. And overseas, the situation is even worse. Police are out in the streets, pressing people on what they're doing and where they're going. While you couldn't even stand within three feet of your roommates anyway for fear of catching this, one day you wake up and they're all gone, back home with their families to ride out the duration of the mandatory quarantine. It would have been nice having them around. Even if you couldn't touch, at least you'd have someone to talk to. But what do you do to cope now that you're on your own and you have to deal with this situation all by yourself? It's tempting to grab your phone, lay in bed, and scroll through Instagram or Facebook all day, but the mental overload those will inevitably cause might make the situation worse. So in between FaceTime calls with your family and in the silence of your now deserted house, you're going to need some other strategies. The first thing that's recommended is to stay calm. As you come to terms with the totality of this dire situation, your fight-or-flight stress response is going to kick in, and likely at full blast. So it can be helpful to recognize the weird sensations you're feeling as being connected to that natural process. One of the first telltale signs is that your skin might start to feel cooler and even go pale as blood is being sent to its extremities like your arms and legs. But it could also be rerouted to your shoulders, brain, eyes, ears, and nose. The eyes, ears, and nose might seem strange to add to the mix, but it's just our body's ways of making sure our sense of smell, taste, and hearing are all heightened. This mechanism also pulls blood away from the skin, which would decrease bleeding from possible cuts and scrapes, which makes sense in the event that this apocalyptic reality gets so weird that you're running for your life from a possessed creature and you don't want to be slowed down by a scraped knee. Next, you'll be able to recognize your body's increased stress response by immediate sweating, which is your body's way of preparing itself for any major actions you might need to take. So you might feel like you desperately need to drink some water. Yep, science says this is because the gastrointestinal juices delightful, and saliva production both go down as blood flow to your digestive system is decreased. So say you do start to feel that onslaught of panic and recognize that they're fight or flight symptoms, what should you do? We all passively breathe, but now you're going to have to go a step beyond and channel that hippy-dippy yoga teacher you've always found to be extremely pretentious. You'd always poked fun at her, but what she was teaching during that class will serve you well. You recall that she stressed the importance of being intentional about your breathing. First, you've got to find a spot where it's quiet and make your spine all nice and straight. You could do this by sitting at a dining room chair or anywhere else. It's best to then fill your abdomen up like a balloon on the inhale feeling it move into your rib cage, and then upper chest and then letting it out slowly on the exhale, contracting your ab muscles as you do. And don't worry, you've got abs under there no matter how many bags of Doritos from your emergency food supply you've already torn into. Experts suggest doing this strategic breathing for 5 minutes for its soothing effects to take over your panicked nervous system. But if you're gonna have a freak out moment, experts say sometimes the best thing you can do is just let yourself feel it. Give yourself a worry window. This window could be just 15 to 30 minutes during the morning or the afternoon. Any time that's time to set aside for you to scream, pace, yell into the void, or into your pillow. The mechanism of coping looks different for everyone, so you've got to find what works for you. However, one thing that's not recommended is doing this right before you go to sleep, because it could wreak havoc on your sleep schedule. If you're the journaling type, you could also write down all your worries without putting any pressure on yourself to fix them. Putting the mess that's most likely going through your head at the moment to paper will be therapeutic in and of itself. Another thing to be knowledgeable of is that chronically lonely people, and you're going to be getting very lonely during this time, have higher blood pressure and are more susceptible to infections and in the long run are even more likely to develop Alzheimer's disease and dementia. You might also eventually feel that your attention, logic, and verbal reasoning skills are being compromised during your time of severe aloneness. Have you ever gone out after spending a whole weekend alone, playing video games, and then found that you've almost forgotten how to talk? Why this happens is a bit unclear, but what is known is that because of the cascade of stress hormones and thus inflammation that you'll be experiencing, social isolation could equal an extreme immune response. But that therapeutic breathing we all explained earlier will certainly help. Something else to help you move through this is to become extremely mentally disciplined, harnessing all your focus on your inner world, because suddenly there's not as much mental stimulation from the outside world. The author Emily Dickinson is one example of a historical figure who showed that this could not only be done, but be used in a way to enhance one's creativity and help him or her hone their craft. 
Dickinson's name goes hand in hand with a reclusive lifestyle. She spent years living alone in her house in Massachusetts. It's not exactly known why. Some speculate that it could have been because of depression or agoraphobia. Regardless, she often wrote about how her solitude only helped catapult her soul and mind, and she's one of the most lauded writers of our time. So, who knows, this forced isolation might turn out to be the best opportunity you've ever had to let your creative side shine and get started on that epic nine-part sci-fi space opera spanning thousands of galaxies and millions of years. Or you could dabble in poetry, your call. Another great way to maintain your sanity is to make sure you stick to a routine, meaning it'd be wisest to wake up at pretty much the same time every day and exercise, journal, write, sing or hum, and read at the same time each day. And at the same time, there's nothing to be said for changing your routine up in an effort to keep your mind sharp. You might have to change your routine a little bit for the sake of waking up your brain cells, keeping your mind sharp and coaxing your brain into thinking more creatively, even if whatever change you make to your routine is just temporary. Even a small change will encourage your brain's neuroplasticity, a fancy way of describing how well your brain handles change and its ability to reorganize itself when it forms new connections. Neuroplasticity has the added benefit of allowing nerve cells to compensate in case of injury and disease. Lastly, slightly changing your habits will also force your brain to pay attention to what you're doing more carefully. In harnessing all that energy on making sure your mental state is in check and focusing inward, you could connect back with the earth in some way. You could go out for a walk around your neighborhood or sit by a tree or a lake. Just make sure you maintain the recommended distance from other people doing the same thing. You could take a wipe, sanitize a bench seat, and lie down while just feeling the sun, focusing on its warmth on your skin. Maybe it'll conjure up memories of that relaxing cruise you went on a few years ago before they were floating petri dishes of disease. Connecting back to nature seemed to work for former British Marine John Slater, who would voluntarily venture out into a cave on the west coast of Scotland and stay there for up to four months, seeking an existence so different than what he'd known in his youth, where he eventually lost interest in learning how to kill a man using only my thumbs. During these retreats, he'd go out of the cave for just a bit, and then rush back in as the tide started to roll in. Legend has it that he'd sleep with rats crawling all over him, but he remained undisturbed. In regard to his isolation, he was quoted as saying, There's also a cathedral-like silence which helps me think. I'm addicted to harmony, restfulness. You realize the planet's breathing, that the same energy moving those stones is moving your heart. Though it seems Slater couldn't avoid the mental imbalance that all that solitude inevitably has on a person because he reportedly wanted to one day impart to the rest of the world his mystical insights and deep cave-born wisdom on the world through a hand puppet friend he made named Muddy the Frog. Slater isn't the only person recorded who was curious as to what would happen if they remained socially isolated. On March 2, 1956, explorers Josie Loris and Antoine Seni emerged from their caves in Nice, France that they'd voluntarily isolated themselves in. 88 days for Josie and Seni was in his for 126 days. One of the main effects noted in the Atlantic article published in 2015 was a complete disorientation when it came to the passage of time. It seems to be that the passage of time while in the caves was completely and utterly warped. For Senny, who would allegedly sleep for 30 hours at a time and would wake up thinking he just had a short nap. But the primary reason for those wacky sleep patterns was because of the absence of sunlight or clocks, which would regulate their sleep cycles. So make sure you take down those blackout curtains and allow your body's internal clock to continue to operate normally. Something else we can gather from Lores and Senny's cave experiment was the importance of keeping mentally occupied and distracted. Lores coped by beginning the experiment with reading but then eventually lost the desire to. So now's the time to dive into that book you never quite got around to finishing. But if your desire to read begins to taper off, you could listen to music, which was Lores' next move. And then she kept her hands busy by knitting. She was quoted saying, I knitted and knitted some more and looked forward to the time when I would finally see the sun. So even if your interest in one hobby starts to decline, and it's likely it will, make sure you have something new to change over to. In order to keep your body in the best shape possible during this strange time and season in your life, you're going to have to keep moving. Even if you've never worked out a day in your life, now's the time to get the blood pumping by moving your limbs. Experts say exercise can relieve the pain in your knees, shoulders, and the other extremities that can get quite bad when you're mostly sitting around all day. You don't need a fancy yoga mat, and you sure as heck didn't buy one before the store started shutting down, but you can still work out right where you are. Try some slow and steady yoga moves, mountain climbers, or jogging in place. And there you have it. Let's hope you don't ever find yourselves in a situation where your friends desert you during a crisis. But we hope that these tips on how to keep your brain in the best shape 
and how to hopefully get out of the situation if you were involuntarily cut off from human contact are helpful. Now go check out how the infographics show's least important writer dealt with their own brand of isolation and life inside quarantine challenge.